There's a lot of traditional land-based wisdom out there that just doesn't ring true for the maritime side of things. Uh, let sleeping dogs lie, out of sight, out of mind, and what you don't know can't hurt you are all prime examples of advice not to heed when planning your boat's maintenance. Uh, this is a topic where an ounce of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure. Uh, in efforts to protect you from the old wives and their tales, here's a list of seven often neglected items that can ruin your boating day quicker than stepping on a crack can cause you to cry over spilt milk. First up is the stuffing box. Uh, what is it and where is it at? Uh, only boats with inboard engines have stuffing boxes. To locate yours, trace the propeller shaft from the transmission to the point where it exits the hull. That's where the stuffing box will be unless you have a newer dripless style shaft seal. Uh, the purpose of the stuffing box is to allow the propeller shaft to exit the hull while keeping the water out. Uh, the shaft is sealed by compressing packing against it, most often by using a hollow nut that screws onto the inboard side of the shaft tube or a tightening arrangement that uses a plate secured by nuts and studs on either side of the shaft. Uh, the more you tighten either type of gland, the more the packing material is compressed against the shaft. Uh, most packing consists of a square plated material uh, and it comes either as traditional greased or waxed flax or a more modern version impregnated with Teflon. Um, what you should know about it, water helps lubricate the packing material, so it's okay for a stuffing box to leak a few drips, three to four per minute while the vessel is underway. Uh, more than that amount, say 10 drops per minute, or drips while the shaft is not turning indicates the need for maintenance. Uh, a leaking stuffing box can cause a number of issues from corrosion, the spinning shaft slings excess water all over your engine compartment, to sinking, particularly if the boat is left unattended in the water for long periods of time. Uh, packing material hardens over time as the lubrication dries out and it gets worn away by the shaft rotation, allowing water to pass and enter a vessel. When this happens, the first reaction is often to simply just tighten the packing nuts uh, to compress the packing material and stop or reduce the leak. This works to a point, but as the packing gets smaller, it also gets harder. Uh, keep compressing it and it will eventually score the propeller shaft, which will then have to be replaced before the stuffing box will seal properly. So what you should do with your stuffing box? You can avoid excessive leaking and shaft damage by simply replacing the packing on a regular basis. This bit of routine maintenance should only take about an hour and it normally costs less uh, for materials than you'd spend on a mocha frappa latte whatever and a free range muffin. Uh, how often you repack depends on the number of hours your boat's used. As it requires the boat to be out of the water, uh, many owners simply repack the stuffing box as part of their annual haul out uh, or spring commissioning routine. Next up, your anchor road. Uh, while the anchor typically enjoys a place of prominence at the bow, the anchor road itself is relegated to the dark, dank recesses of the anchor locker. In a nutshell, its purpose is connecting the boat to the anchor. The anchor road not only has to be strong, but also possess at least some degree of stretchiness to absorb the effects of uh, wind and waves. This helps prevent surge damage to the attachment point on the boat while reducing the chance an anchor will be ripped free from the bottom when it's needed the most. Now, uh, this would be a little bit different if you have an all-chain road. Uh, in that case, of course, the chain is not going to have any stretchiness. However, you will be utilizing a, uh, a snubber or bridle in conjunction with the chain to attach it to the vessel, and that's where the stretchiness would come from. Well, a lot of boats, uh, particularly cruising boats, may use all-chain road. Uh, most boats will use a combination road, which is simply a, a rope road with a short length of chain between it and the anchor. Uh, you can attach your rope road directly to the anchor, but it's not recommended. That length of chain protects the rope portion of the road from chafe while adding weight, which increases horizontal pull and helps the anchor to remain set. As for the type of line to use, uh, three-strand nylon is the most common. It's strong and provides more elasticity than braided line, and it's also more easily spliced, and it's cheaper too. Your anchoring system is only as strong as its weakest component, which includes not only the road, but also shackles, splices, chains, mooring bits, cleats, in short, any gear used to secure your boat while at anchor. 
Proper maintenance includes inspection of these as well as pulling the road from the anchor locker and laying it out for a thorough examination at least annually. Uh, check rope roads for issues such as wear, cut strands, aging discoloration, and hard spots due to heat generated by friction caused by placing a kink line under load. Uh, chafe is a rope road's worst enemy, so you'll also want to check hauls holes, cleats, chocks, windlasses, and other areas of potential chafe for burrs, sharp edges, protruding hardware, or anything else that can cause road damage. Uh, outdrive bellows. Uh, outdrives have flexible gaskets or rubber boots called bellows. Similar in appearance to an accordion, they seal out water around the exhaust and universal joint and shift cable while allowing the drive itself to pivot and tilt while underway. Uh, outdrive bellows can dry out and fail due to a number of reasons, from heat and extreme weather to age. They can also be cut or torn due to marine growth, such as barnacles, muzzles, and the like. Uh, cracks or splits often occur inside the folds of the bellows. These can be difficult to see unless the drive is raised or tilted to the left or the right, depending on the type and location, so that the bellows can be fully extended for inspection. A damaged bellow can cause damage to output shafts and gimbal bearings due to water-induced corrosion and can even lead to sinking in some cases. What you should do, uh, you should inspect all waterproof grommets and bellows for tears, cracks, dry rot, and other damage at intervals recommended by the manufacturer as part of your routine maintenance schedule. Inspection time frames may vary between manufacturers, but twice yearly at the beginning and end of the boating season is always a good start. Uh, you'll also want to follow the manufacturer's recommended replacement schedule for your bellows, regardless of appearance, uh, to head off any failure-related issues before they occur. Fuel tank fuel hoses. Fuel hoses are attached to the underside of the fuel deck fitting connecting it to your fuel tank. Um, all hose has a limited lifespan and fuel fuel hose is no exception. Uh, Recommended replacement time frames will vary between fuel hose manufacturers, but some call for replacement as often as every five years. ABYC, the American Boat and Yacht Council, standards also call for flexible fuel fill hose to be double clamped at each end with marine grade stainless steel clamps and to be marked on the outermost cover with the manufacturer's name or trademark, year of manufacture, and application. In other words, it should say fuel hose right on it. Um, what you should do, uh, you should access and inspect fuel tank fill hoses for leaks and deterioration as part of your vessel's routine maintenance program. Check that each end of the hose is properly clamped and that the clamps themselves are tight and free from corrosion. Replace older hoses regardless of appearance as per the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, if there is no recommendation, you know, hose, like everything else, got a limited lifespan, as we just talked about. Um, Ten years is commonly quoted, so uh, if there's no specific recommendation from the manufacturer, you should replace your fuel tank fuel hoses uh, and the vent hose as well every 10 years, regardless of how it looks. Deck coring. Uh, most all fiberglass boats utilize cord decks. Uh, a construction method where a core material such as marine plywood, ingrain balsa, or foam, or some other material is epoxied to and sandwiched between two layers of fiberglass. Due to the I-beam effect, uh, cord construction is lighter and stronger than solid fiberglass of similar thickness. Preventing moisture from entering a cord deck is crucial to maintaining its strength and integrity. Unless the deck has been damaged in some way, water intrusion is normally by leaking at a deck-mounted uh, hardware and fittings such as cleats, tank fills, uh, bow pulpits, or stanchion mounts. Leaks into the coring are typically caused by a combination of failed or lack of caulking during hardware installation and improper sealing of exposed coring when hardware mounting holes are drilled. Uh, water entry into the coring can quickly lead to rot depending on the core material, and delamination or separation of the coring from the fiberglass. Classic symptoms of this include decks that have a spongy feel when walked on or that ooze water from deck fittings. Even the, uh, the more modern foam cores that are used, they're not, you know, they're not safe from this either because if they get wet, the, the manufacturer may say, well, they won't uh, rot, 
But if you're at a place where you have winter uh, and freeze temperatures, the thaw and freeze cycles, uh, expansion and contraction of the water in there can actually separate the coring at that time as well. Um, what you should do as far as your deck coring, remove and rebed caulking deck hardware uh, is the simplest and easiest thing you can do to prevent it. Uh, you should do this every seven to 10 years as a routine maintenance item. Another is to follow the cord deck golden rule. Seal the exposed edge of the coring with marine grade epoxy when drilling and mounting hardware. If you're able to decor the area around the holes, you can then fill them with thickened epoxy and once cured, drill through the plug of epoxy without fear of moisture entry into the coring. Electric bilge pumps. Uh, bilge pumps are typically located at the lowest portion of your bilge, which makes sense as that's where any water that enters the hole would naturally gravitate to. Uh, if you have multiple bilge compartments or isolated sections, you'll likely have more than one bilge pump. A bilge pump's uh, primary job is clearing incidental water from the bilges, such as packing land drips, rainwater, uh, and just nuisance water from other sources. Uh, while they can provide extra time to do stuff when taking on serious water, such as putting on life jackets or making a mayday call, don't confuse your bilge pump with an emergency pump, which provides much greater dewatering capacity. Uh, what you should know, uh, just because a bilge pump is rated to pump a certain amount of water, say 500 gallons per hour or GPH, that doesn't mean that it'll actually do that. While testers in the lab may be able to squeeze 500 uh, gallons per hour from a pump without a discharge hose and under perfect conditions, a number of constraints that make doing so in the real world a different story. One crucial factor that contributes to this reduced output is called static head. The vertical distance bilge water has to be pumped up before it can be pumped out. Just two feet of static head can reduce the output of a 500 gallons per hour pump by half, while 15 to 20 feet might neutralize the pump entirely. Uh, what you should do, uh, test and verify operation of all bilge pumps at regular intervals, quarterly or semi-annually at a minimum, preferably every time you go out. Uh, do this particularly if the vessel is kept in a slip Testing should verify the actual pumping of water overboard rather than, in the case of electric bilge pumps, simply switching the pump on and listening for motor noise. Um, the best way to keep your bilge pumps working is to conduct routine maintenance before problems occur. The corrosive environment of the bilge is a harsh place for all things electric, so be sure to check all wires and connectors for corrosion and use only marine grade heat shrink style connectors, no wire nuts or electrical tape joints here. Uh, pump disassembly for maintenance is normally straightforward. However, some are more complex than others, so be sure to read all of the instructions carefully to avoid assembly mistakes. Gasoline engine compartment ventilation ducting. Uh, where is it at and what does it do? Uh, located in the engine compartment, ducting provides the means of bringing fresh air into the engine compartment and evacuating any gasoline fumes to the exterior of the vessel. Uh, what you should know about them, Gasoline fumes are highly volatile and a leading cause of marine-related explosions and fires. If your boat has an inboard gasoline engine, uh, proper ventilation of the compartment is crucial, both from a safety and legal standpoint. Federal law stipulates that the use of a mechanical ventilation system, i.e. Uh, one utilizing a blower, uh, for all non-open gasoline-powered boats built after 1981. Uh, what you should do, inspect the ducting regularly for splits, tears, blockage, crush points, and loose connections. Ensure that the air intake ductwork ends, extends, and is permanently secured to a point at least midway to the bilge or below the engine carburetor, and that the exhaust ductwork end is permanently secured in the lower one-third of the compartment, as nearly as practical below of the engines, but above the normal accumulation of bilge water. Ducting insulation must also be self-draining in the event that water enters the ducting. 